with Dr. Uh, with Bob Carter, who's a marine geologist, environmental scientist with 40 years professional experience, like I said, another flake fringe scientist, uh, skeptic. He has held academic positions at Otaga University and the University of Adalid, how do you say that? And is currently a research professor at James Cook University, Queensland, where he was head of the School of Earth Sciences between 1981 and 1999. He's former chairman of the Marine Science and Technologies Award Committee and the National Committee on Earth Sciences. He is an overseas honorary fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and his current research on climate change, sea level, and stratigraphy, stratigraphy is based on field studies of Cen Cenozoic sediments from the Southwest Pacific region and includes the analysis of marine sediment cores collected during the ocean drilling program leg 181 in the South Pacific Ocean east of New Zealand. And we welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be speaking at the Hartland Four conference. My first and last slides are both intentionally scary. Uh, the first slide is what I call the sort of trashy science that is used to raise public alarm. It's a graphic depiction of what happens to the Statue of Liberty if you melt all the present ice on the planet. There is no possibility, of course, of that happening in any human scale. The equivalent uh, alarmist uh, uh, last slide will leave until we get there. What I want to do is take you through some of the ways in which scientists, and I'm alarmed to find 90% of the audience is professional scientists because they mostly know this, but I'm going to take you through the ways in which scientists actually reconstruct past sea level, the sort of evidence that uh, has, has been discussed by Nils. So it starts here, and this curve goes back about 1.8 million years to 1,800 thousand years ago, one million eight hundred thousand years ago, and this is the climatic cycling that the Earth has been through over the last couple of million years. It's a curve that's uh, seen in many places in many different guises, and the question is where does it come from? How do scientists achieve this curve? And the answer is these little critters here. Uh, this is a sample of deep sea mud, uh, carbonate mud. It's made out of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and the most important organism in it is this little uh, floating amoeba with a shell. And Globigerina having this shell of CaCO3, it's got oxygen in it. And the key to this whole curve is oxygen, because oxygen occurs in two different isotopes. Oxygen 18, slightly heavier, and oxygen 16, slightly lighter. Now, of course, if they are slightly different in their atomic weight, then when you pass them through a mass spectrometer which separates uh, um, um, atoms according to their uh, weight, then they impinge on two different collectors. And you can measure the ratio from a sample of one of these little beasties, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 60. It turns out, for reasons I don't have time to go into, that that ratio, which is what is actually plotted on this axis here, uh, delta O18, that ratio uh, relates to two things. And one thing is the water temperature from which these beasts were living, and the other thing is the ratio actually in the seawater itself, and the seawater comes in part when it changes from glaciation to interglaciation by melting of glaciers. So it's the oxygen isotope ratio in the glaciers, which melt in and out of the ocean, plus the temperature of the ocean that controls this curve. Appropriate corrections, you can turn the oxygen isotope measurement, and I'm just showing this here for the last, uh, I can't see, 400,000 years, you can turn it into a, a sea level change curve. You can also change it into a temperature curve, but the blue here is the sea level curve. And we see here on this scale that going from a warm interglacial, which is where we are today, to the peak of the last glaciation, just 20,000 years ago, that's this point in here, this warming and the sea level rise, the magnitude of the sea level rise is 120 metres. And that's a lot of sea level. So you stand on the beach out here, uh, east of here in New Jersey, and you look seaward today from the beach, you can't see where the low stand shoreline was, the glacial shoreline, just 20,000 years ago. It's out over the horizon. These are dramatic, real environmental and climatic changes. 
So what we've got then in this curve, which goes back to two million years and beyond, is a proxy of ancient sea level change. And the first thing you see is just like climate, sea level always changes. Now I want to now discuss and show you how we test this curve, because this is in a sense theoretical science. It's beautiful science, but it's theoretical science. It's measurements of, of ratios of, of oxygen atoms in little protests from the seafloor. For goodness sake, that's Dr. Spock stuff. Uh, how can we test that against some other empirical data? Well, here's how we do it. And I'm just doing the part in this bracket, the last 20,000 years, just looking at this rise from the glacial low stand to today. And here we have that curve then spread out a bit, so unfortunately it goes to the last glaciation, which is when sea level was 120 metres below uh, today. And what we see is these points on here key out to places all over the world. They're actual samples taken from continental margins, from shallow water around the continents around the world. And from the measurement of the age of those samples, we can plot them, and they define a sea level curve, which is very similar, but completely different evidential line to the theoretical curve I've just shown you, taken from muds on the bottom of the ocean floor. So moving on, oh, and the rates at which this rises, this is about 200 me centimetres per century, two metres per century, the uh, sea levels rising through here, whereas for the last 10,000 years, the warm period that we live at the end of here today, the rate is an order of magnitude less. It's only up to about 20 centimetres per century. So we have a, a relatively stable sea level, but still rising. And this global curve is called the eustatic sea level curve. And this is a critical thing I want you to get out of this talk. These two curves I've just shown you, the first one, and this one is the average global sea level curve. Now, I don't know a person that builds their house in terms of the average global temperature. You ask the architect to design your house for Chicago and it's a bit, bit toey in the winter here. I live in the tropics and when they design my house they're more interested in an air conditioner than they are in a heater, as you are. So, I, at the end of the talk I'm going to make the comment that governments around the world are basing their sea level policies on advice from the IPCC which relates to global or eustatic sea level curve. It makes no sense whatsoever. You need to plan your sea level policy in terms of the actual real sea level change on your little piece of coast. Come back to that later. Here's some of the ways in which we reconstruct sea level. This is in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef coast and you see an oyster bed running around here. And if we come in a bit closer, here's the top of that oyster bed which is about 0.4 metres above the average tide datum. And these oysters are living. You can pick them and eat them, except it's a national park and they'll put you in prison if you do. But if you now go around the corner here behind this big boulder, here's what you find. And what you find is oysters that you can't pick and eat because they're dead. They're 5,000 years dead. This is a fossil oyster bed. And the top of it here is at about 2.07, effectively two metres above Australian height, height datum. And the radiocarbon dates tell us it's about five to 4,000 years old. Well, let that sink in. Here we are standing. There's the modern shoreline just there. But we've got this ancient oyster bed, 5,000 years old, that's just a couple of metres higher. Well, even an Australian geologist can work out that, that means that sea level was higher to 5,000 years ago at this spot. And it might seem a simple inference. It's a critically important inference. OK. We have other evidence of the same sort. Just off from the city where I live, the city of Townsville, is one of these fringing reefs, and it looks at first sight to be okay, where you can see some nice corals. There. But if you look more carefully, you see between the corals there's a lot of, of nothing, dead, older-looking, weathered, rubbly coral. And if we look at other intertidal reefs today, this is the situation. They're entirely dead. And they were dead when Captain Cook first found this coast. This has nothing to do with our impact on the reef. It is the case that most of the fringing reefs in the Great Barrier Reef have dead reef flats with just the odd coral growing on. We have to go right out to the edge of the reef flat where the modern... And they're like a miller's milling stone, or if you like a New York donut, they've got a hole in the middle. Because they grow up to sea level and then they can't grow any further, so they grow out concentrically. They're called micro-atholls. They're a very sensitive indicator of precisely where the average mean tide level is. 
So if we now look at a reef like this and we walk across it, one of these uh, reefs, we find these old micro atolls. Scores of them. There's living ones out here at the edge, but these are all dead. And again, two and two makes four, that must mean that they relate to a former slightly higher sea level. Indeed they do. And here's the uh, cross section of four such reefs. Out here at the edge we've got living micro atolls, but as we go back across these reefs, and th this is about two metres, uh, you find that the, the uh, micro atolls date, uh, get older and older and older to about 5,000 years uh, in on the edge of the, the modern mangroves. So again, it's very clear that the sea level relatively has fallen here on all these fringing reefs in the last uh, few thousand years. And here's the curve that summarises it. So 6,000 years ago through to today, with the error bars, here are all the micro atolls plotted up. There's the uh, Balding Bay oyster bed we short saw before, and all the evidence is the same. It indicates a sea level of one to one and a half metres higher than today, about five to 6,000 years ago. So sea level has relatively fallen in the last 5,000 years. That's not uncommon in many places of the world, but it's not everywhere. Horses for courses. This is local relative sea level. Now, we've been talking about this, here's today's sea level, if you like, and we've been talking about this bit in here, the shoreline, and there could be a bit of a reef we've looked at, a, an estuarine lagoon, uh, and a shore-connected sediment wedge of sand and mud. But when we go off onto the continental shelf, we find on the bottom here other old shoreline deposits at what is called the sea level low stand. This is 120 metres 20,000 years ago when the sea level fell and the shoreline migrated seawards. This is the last... A glacial low stand shoreline. So we can find a particular example, this is from Korea, uh, here's the depth, that's 120 metres, 140 metres, and here you see sediments coming in and lapping out and pinching out there at a shoreline which is about 120 metres depth. We can take a core through here, and here there's notionally what we're doing, we're taking a core through there, and we get a little bit of well-sorted sand, gravelly sand, which is the yellow, and it sits on this grey mud, which is an estuarine uh, back barrier mud, and it has uh, mollusks in it, which only live in estuarine situation. Meanwhile, in the sand, the shore face sand, uh, these beasties are intertidal, sandy, exposed beach mollusks, and we date them by radiocarbon dating, and they're 20,000 years old. And that, of course, is the age of the last ice age, last glacial low stand. So here we have oyster beds above sea level, and we have micro atolls above sea level, and that tells us something about sea level in the last 10,000 years. And here we have a buried beach, or a drowned beach, out on the continental shelf, which tells us about sea level 20,000 years ago. And it's, it's points like this that define that other sea level curve, the second one we looked at. If we go to where Nils lives in Scandinavia, northern part of, Den of Norway, we find these gravel made of shells, gravelly shell uh, strand line deposits uh, made of mollusk shells, and they're sitting at 20 or 30 metres above sea level. Say that again, 20 or 30 metres above sea level. And the radiocarbon dates here are uh, about 5,000, 6,000 years old again. So where in Australia the sea level uh, 5,000 years ago was just two metres higher in the day, here in Scandinavia, because this used to be at the shoreline, 30 metres lower, just 5,000 years ago, uh, we, we've got the, these are now lifted up in the air. Why? How did that happen? It happened because when you build an ice cap on top of Scandinavia, you depress the crust, it sinks. When you melt the ice cap off, the crust rebounds. It's called isostatic rebound. That's the spot at which we uh, saw those uh, shell beds. Uh, and the uplift rate in the middle here is as high as 20 metres per thousand years. That's 100 metres of uplift, that's this inner circle here, in the last 5,000 years. And so the relative local sea level changes accordingly. I'm going to skip that because I haven't got time to do it. And I'm going to come to this. So if we now take a computer model, and this is the eustatic sea level rise we assume. The last of the glaciers melt up to 5,000 years ago and then there's no change, no extra water in the ocean last 5,000 years. Then around the world, these are the different local sea level curves that we get. Here's our Scandinavian one. 
where deposits 6,000 years old are up to 40 or 50 meters in the air today because they've been uplifted by the isostatic rebound. We go to Australia, far field out here in Australia, we find sea level came up and slightly overshot the modern level and then it settled back down. So we get different local relative sea level curves all over the world depending upon the local geological conditions. Meanwhile, in a computerized air conditioned office in New York, the IPCC <laughs> is doing its computer models which take no account whatsoever of any of this. They merely are projections of the eustatic sea level, the global average, which is of no particular interest to anybody. But anyway, this is what they project. A change between, I can't read it, 11 uh, centimetres and 177 centimetres, and this is a few years old, this estimate, but that was their estimate in 2001 for the sea level rise in the next 100 years. Meanwhile, in the real world, tide gauge measurements show that this is what is happening, and we have a steady, slow, uh, it's one to two millimetres per year rise in sea level. This is for Europe. This is for Australia. The longest record is about 150 years long. No trace of any acceleration recently. Just steady incremental sea level rise. Get used to it. You've got to live with it. Mayor denies demolition plans. Believe it or not, the Byron Bay Council has made it illegal for people to protect their houses from marine erosion because they are planning for up to a metre sea level rise in the next 100 years. The likely sea level rise is of the order of 10 or 15 centimetres. Most discussion, I'm quoting Singer et al, the NIPIC report, including that of the IPCC, is formulated in terms of global average eustatic sea level. Even assuming this statistic can be estimated accurately, it has little practical policy value. Local relative sea level change is all that counts for purposes of coastal planning, and this is highly variable worldwide. I have one conclusion for you, one point to remember, and I've written it out because it's so important. In using IPCC advice to set their policies on sea level change, national governments are negligent and fail utterly to fulfill their duty of care to their people. Thank you.